This podcast is sponsored by Release Winery. Every wine tells a story. Each growing season, it's our goal to create an artisan Napa Valley wine of exceptional quality. Join us as the story of this ultra-limited wine continues. Learn more at releasewinery.com. We opened our doors here in 2015, Memorial Day, for our very first open house. Uh, when we did that, we opened with uh, red wines that were produced in the 2013 vintage, Pinot Noir and Syrah, and with the 2014 Pinot Blanc and Rosé of Pinot Noir. The plan was always, when we opened up, to make sure that we had a full, diverse lineup. Um, we want to make sure that we have a, a wide range of wines for folks that you know want to experience things maybe other than just Pinot Noir here. Um, um, and so we wanted to make sure that everybody's first uh, introduction to us was as a full service winery. Correct, and my Syrah is actually not grown from here either. Um, it's grown in uh, the town of Milton Freewater, uh, so right across the state line from Walla Walla, Washington. I, however, make Syrah a little bit differently than a lot of people do, and I, I always talk about it when people come in because here we are in the Willamette Valley, it's obviously Pinot country and so many wonderful Pinots here, and, and I think what is so special about the Pinot that we do here in the Valley is the delicacy, the layers, the texture, and I don't want to lose that just because I'm making Syrah. So I, I always say I make Syrah for Pinot drinkers, not for Syrah drinkers. Uh, so my Syrah is very different. It ends up being much lighter, much more approachable. You know, I wouldn't say it's completely old world Rhone, but it's certainly a lot closer to that than what you would normally find in a Walla Walla wine or in a California Syrah. I was an attorney, yep, I was, uh, I was a tax lawyer for 10 years. Um, I did corporate transactional works. I was based out of Cincinnati, Ohio, um, and, uh, but just because you're based somewhere doesn't mean that you're going to spend most of your time there. It's wherever the particular deal goes. So uh, I would get pulled to kind of wherever the transaction was happening. So I would go all over, you know, I've been to New York and Chicago, Houston, Detroit, it's sort of, and then a bunch of smaller towns as well. I did that for 10 years and uh, that's, that was sort of my, my previous career where I figured out I did not want to spend the rest of my life doing that. Kind of, sort of, yeah. We, uh, it was back in 2006. Um, it was my wife Sarah and my fifth year wedding anniversary. And we were looking for something to do as a couple's hobby. And we, were, we really enjoyed consuming wine. We knew a little bit about wine, but you know, you would never confuse us with sommeliers or people doing the masters in wine exams or anything like that. Um, but we thought it might be a, a fun idea to try to make wine ourselves, and we were told that hey, there are these kits and boxes you can buy. So we went over to the west side of town to this supply store, and we talked to the folks behind the counter, and they stocked us up on everything we needed. And and then at the end, they say, oh, by the way, there's this class that uh, there's a retired gentleman that runs this class on how to make the kit wines, and. Well, you know, we don't want to do it the wrong way, so we signed up for the class, and they take you through an entire session of, of making a batch of this kit wine, and yeah, you know, the wine was drinkable, but what was really important was I really fell in love with the process and really trying to understand what I was seeing, smelling, tasting. Um, it started to teach me so much behind what it was in the end product that I was, that I was drinking. Oh, this is why it does, and this is what goes into it. Um, you know, I think so many times, you know, the p humans have been fermenting grape juice for 6,000 years. It's not rocket science, but you know, so many, so many of us, we've never been that close to what's going on during that process when the magic is happening. And so it was just something that I, it hit me on a very soulful level and I started to want to learn more and more about it. My wife will say that I started to become obsessed with it. Won't necessarily disagree with her on that because what I started to see was, you know, we started making more and more wine and it started to take up more and more of the house. And, uh, and so we started to incorporate, as a result of that, we started to incorporate wine trips into our vacations. Um, but we have never been the type to go to the big, you know, we're not, we're not Napa Sonoma people. We, we wanted to go to the places that were a little bit more under the radar. Um, and what's great about those places is you get so many opportunities to interact and learn and talk 
talk to people that are involved in the, all the day-to-day -day operations. Um, you know, you're not getting a lot of hired hands. You're getting a lot of owners and winemakers and folks that are directly involved in the process. But then in 2008 was our first visit here to the Willamette Valley. We spent four days in early August roaming around at a time when there were oh, probably half the number of wineries that there are now, but so many of them were like what we have built here. They were very small, um, and when you went in, you were talking to the people that were doing the work. And here I was as sort of a newbie winemaker and asking probably a lot of questions that, sure, in retrospect, I probably would roll my eyes if I was asking these really accomplished folks these very basic newbie questions. But what was great about being here was the folks that I talked to never made me feel like I was some sort of second-class citizen. You know, they, they really treated me like, hey, here's somebody who's interested and wanting to learn, and they really gave so much of their time and <laughs> patience, quite frankly, um, to just walking me through it and showing me the insides. Um, and, and I, when Sarah and I came back from that trip, we, we were just so overwhelmed, and we felt, wow, wouldn't this be something fun to do? in 2025 20, years when we retired. You know, we were still, you know, we were still in, in our careers and still thought that was gonna go. But when we got back from that trip, within about a month, we had two things happen. One was my firm started to really push me to go uh, on partner track which by then I had really decided is not what I wanted to do. And, and the typical firm has the up or out mentality. So I kind of suspected that over time my days would, would probably be numbered given that I wasn't wanting to go up. The other thing that happened, um, sadly, was that Sarah's professional mentor at age 40 was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And she had three young children and a husband. And you know, this was somebody, obviously, that Sarah looked up to immensely, was so critical in forming her career. And somebody who I, I got to know a little bit, but I could really tell was a, a powerful person and just uh, you know, somebody who you would absolutely want to emulate. And seeing her slowly fade away over the course of about the next eight, nine months was that real kick in the butt for us that you know, the future is not guaranteed. And if you have an opportunity to do something that might really make a big change in your and everybody else's life, try it before you lose that opportunity.